everybody. Everybody happy? Hi to all you wonderful people in Los Angeles and to all you wonderful people who are joined with us via live stream. How about if you Los Angeles turn around and wave and say hi to everybody, all the various places on the earth where they are. Okay, now for those of us here, please introduce yourselves to the people who are around you, to your right, to your left, in front of you and behind you. All right, everybody, let's take a deep breath and close our eyes. <clears throat> we see in the middle of our mind a little ball of golden light. And now we watch this light as it begins to grow larger and larger until now it covers the entire inner vision of our mind. And we see for ourselves within this light a beautiful temple we see a garden that surrounds the temple and a body of water that flows through the garden. We see that the inside of the temple is lit by the same beautiful golden light. And here we are, for we have been drawn together by the power and in the presence of God. We divide our time spent together, our relationships and experiences of each other to him. We pray that God's most Holy Spirit now be upon us, entering into the deepest regions of every thought we think and every feeling we have, that we might thus be lifted above and beyond the sorrows and limitations and fears of this world to the love and endless peace that lay beyond. And so it is together we all say, Amen. <clears throat> The way to be most powerful in any situation is to be clear about who you are on an essential level and why you are there on an essential level. The thinking of the world does not speak to us of essentials. The thinking of the world teaches us about non-essentials. Our spiritual power comes from our spiritual clarity, and our spiritual clarity has to do with who are we really and why are we here really. Often we talk about your identity as a spiritual being, how enlightenment is a shift in self-perception from body identification to spirit identification. But tonight what we're going to talk about is your purpose in being here. I want to begin by reading from the workbook of A Course in Miracles, lesson 154, and that is, I am among the ministers of God. Now, when you were talking about either your identity or your purpose. Whenever you are speaking about something that is true of you, but not of others, you are not speaking about your essence. Now, the thinking of the world leads you to believe that you have to find that which is unique about you. But the truth of the matter is that you find what is unique about yourself by looking for that which is not unique at all. It is when we find that within ourselves and as an attribute of our purpose in the world, which is that that we share with everyone that we find our essence. Then grounded in our essence, we more easily and more fully find our individual expression of that common essence. So some of us are educators, some of us are business people, some of us are artists, some of us are scientists. Some of us are whatever we are in terms of the world. But if I'm an artist, then that means I'm different than people who are not artists. That means I'm not down at the deepest essence of who I am. 
which means that I will not be as powerful as an artist. We are all here for a common purpose. So lesson 154 grounds us in the teachings of the Course in Miracles so that we can explore most fully that whole topic and conversation. I am among the ministers of God. This is not all of it, but it's most of it. <clears throat> Let us today be neither arrogant nor falsely humble. We have gone beyond such foolishness. We cannot judge ourselves, nor we need do so. These are but attempts to hold decisions off and to delay commitment to our function. It is not our part to judge our worth, nor can we know what role is best for us. What we can do within a larger plan, we cannot see in its entirety. Our part is cast in heaven, not in hell. And what we think is weakness can be strength. What we believe to be our strength is often arrogance. So this is amazing because it's saying that our power comes from commitment to our function, but that you can't figure out what your function is because you don't know where your part fits in. One of the things The Course in Miracles talks about is beware the temptation to self-initiated plans. You know, we are a society in which part of our confusion sometimes, part of our paralysis, is that we have so many choices we don't know where to go. And it's wonderful that we have freedom, but if freedom is interpreted by the mind to mean nothing more than, I don't know, do whatever you want to do, then you are not actually cast on a free path. You're actually imprisoned by this belief that it's yours to decide where you fit into the larger universe. And that leaves you in a sense that the universe is chaotic. And any time our sense of ourselves is such that we think that we dwell within a chaotic universe, we cannot but suffer. So the idea of commitment to a function is commitment to a function that we did not create. It's a commitment to a function which was created by that which is greater than we. So the liver cell doesn't decide to be a cell in the liver. The blood cell doesn't decide to be a cell in the blood system. A cell in the bone does not decide to be a cell in the bone. Rather, a natural intelligence moves through it and assigns it to the place where it can be of greatest service to the healthy functioning of the organ of which it is part, and thus the organism of which it is part. <clears throat> Back to the Course. Whatever your appointed role may be, and the Course in Miracles, now I'm not reading from the text, the Course in Miracles says each and every one of us has an assigned role, and no one's role is any more important than anyone else's. The Course in Miracles says all of the teachers of God are special and none of the teachers of God are special. The Course in Miracles says each of us has an infinite amount of power to be used in the service of the healing of the world. A Course in Miracles says that those on the planet who have achieved the most, think of the great geniuses who have lived and are living. A Course in Miracles says that those people have achieved a fraction of what each and every one of us is capable of. It is not arrogant for you to know that about yourself. It is humble for you to know that about yourself because you're not claiming that you created it. It is a power in you but not of you and what is humble is merely accepting this. It is arrogant to believe that you are less because the only way you could be less is if God did not create you. And A Course in Miracles says that is an arrogant perception. So back to the text, back to the workbook. Whatever your appointed role may be, it was selected by the voice for God, whose function is to speak for you as well. Seeing your strengths exactly as they are, and equally aware of where they can be best applied, for what? to whom and when. He chooses and accepts your part for you. He does not work without your own consent, but he is not deceived in what you are and listens only to his voice in you. So we don't know 
you know, you, you can't really know where you would best be of use. But you don't have to worry. It's like my friend who said to me many years ago, I don't know, you told me to just, in a lecture I heard you say, just do what God would have you do. She said, I'm a musician. What if God wants me to be an accountant? And I remember saying to her, why would he, you suck at math, you are not good at math. Why would God want you to be an accountant? And if God gave you musical talent, that's a clue. It is through his ability to hear one voice, which is, is his own, that you become aware at last there is one voice in you. And that one voice appoints your function and relays it to you, giving you the strength to understand it, do what it entails, and to succeed in everything you do that is related to it. God has joined his son in this, and thus his son becomes his messenger of unity with him. Now, this is very interesting, because what we're saying here is that your function, like everybody else's function, is to become a messenger of God. Now remember, God is love. So to say that your function is as a messenger of God is to say that your function is to be a messenger of love. A messenger, it says, is not the one who writes the message he delivers, nor does he question the right of him who does, nor ask why he has chosen those who will receive the message that he brings. It is enough that he accept it, give it to the ones for whom it is intended, and fulfill his role in its delivery. If he determines what the messages should be, or what their purpose is, or where they should be carried. He is failing to perform his proper part as bringer of the word. I know you've probably heard me talk before about how sometimes I'll be talking to people and say, remember, you're the faucet, you're not the water. And that's extremely important. You're just a delivery system. So the spirit of God which lies within you, no more in you than in anyone else, so don't get all nervous about maybe it'll make you conceited. It's no more in you than anyone else, but it is no less in you than anyone else. That's the point, because all of us actually are one. So in terms of essentials, what is in anyone is in everyone. And that's what frees you from a fear of shining. It's humble to shine. You're not claiming to be the water, you just happen to be the faucet. And that's a very different kind of self-perception, and it eliminates fear. There is, it now going back to the words, there is but one, there is one major difference in the role of heaven's messengers, which sets them off from those the world appoints. The messages that they deliver are intended first for them. And it is only as they can accept them for themselves that they become able to bring them further and to give them everywhere where they were meant to be. Like earthly messengers, they did not write the messages they bear, but they become their first receivers in the truest sense, receiving to prepare themselves to give. An earthly messenger fulfills his role by giving all his messages away. The messengers of God perform their part by their acceptance of his messages as for themselves and show they understand the messages by giving them away. They choose no roles that are not given them by his authority, and so they gain by every message that they give away. Would you receive the messages of God? For thus do you become his messenger. You are appointed now. And yet you wait to give the messages you have received. And so you do not know that they are yours and do not recognize them. No one can receive and understand he has received until he gives. For in the giving is his own acceptance of what he has received. You who are now the messengers of God, receive his messages, for that is part of your appointed role. God has not failed to offer what you need, 
nor has it been left unaccepted. Yet another part of your appointed task is yet to be accomplished. He who has received for you the messengers of God would have them be received by you as well. For thus do you identify with him and claim your own. We practice giving him what he would have that we may recognize his gifts to us. He needs our voice that he may speak through us. I just want to repeat that sentence in this whole paragraph. This is so powerful, I think. He needs our voice that he may speak through us. He needs our hands to hold his messages and carry them to those whom he appoints. He needs our feet to bring us where he wills that those who wait in misery may be at last delivered. And he needs our will, united with his own, that we may be the true receivers of the gifts he gives. Let us but learn this lesson for today. We will not recognize what we receive until we give it. You have heard this said a hundred times, a hundred ways, and yet belief is lacking still. But this is sure, until belief is given it, you will receive a thousand miracles and then receive a thousand more, but will not know that God himself has left no gift beyond what you already have, nor has denied the tiniest of blessings to his son. What can this mean to you until you have identified with him and with his own? Our lesson for today is stated thus, I am among the ministers of God, and I am grateful that I have the means by which to recognize that I am free. The world recedes as we light up our minds and realize these holy words are true. They are the message sent to us today from our Creator. Now we demonstrate how they have changed our mind about ourselves and what our function is. For as we prove that we accept no will we do not share, our many gifts from our Creator will spring to our sight and leap into our hands and we will recognize what we received. All right, now let's look at our daily practical lives because A Course in Miracles talks about how this material is very practical. It's very practical to the extent to which we apply it to our practical circumstances. Now, we wake up in the morning, we figure we know what's going to happen today. We hope this or that might happen. We're in struggle, we're aware of what's not working. We basically, if you take a good look at the way your mind operates, most of us have a pretty shabby self-perception most of the time. Now think how different that is than waking up in the morning and knowing that you are a messenger of God. A Course in Miracles says that God's plan for the salvation of the world. And remember, the first order of salvation is being saved from our own insanity because it is our own insane thinking that has manufactured the insane state of the world. So God, quote unquote, saves us by saving us from our own false thinking or fear. But even then we have to request that because otherwise for his spirit to come in and reorder our thinking would be a violation of our free will. Things are not going to change out there until they're first changed in here so that our thought forms are different. And that is why first we have to receive the messages that God would have us bring. The Course in Miracles that the, says that God's plan for the healing of the world is called in the Course the plan of the teachers of God. I often think about it kind of like white blood cells. You know, we're here to be the white blood cells, the blood cells that are running through the psychic stream of humanity. Then it says, well, who are the teachers of God? And it says the teacher of God is anyone who chooses to be one that they come from all religions and no religion. They are those who have heard the call. But the call is going out all the time. 
The call is going out in every unit of time and space. It is the call within our heart to be fully available and to be fully available to the task at hand in the present moment, to be fully available to life around us, to be fully available to the call of forgiveness, to the call of generosity, to the call of charity, and to the call of giving, which sounds like common sense because it is common sense. The problem, however, is that the thinking of the world runs counter to that. And because the thinking of the world runs counter to that, we are constantly being lured away from that kind of thinking. That kind of thinking is our spiritual clarity. And our spiritual clarity is thinking that is aligned with the mind of God. To the extent to which our thinking is aligned with the mind of God, we are co-creating with God. And this lifts your thinking. It lifts the ethers around you to a higher, what we might call, vibrational frequency. And because all minds are joined, where your mind affects where the minds around you go and then attracts and repels according to where your mind is. And remember, all thought, the Course in Miracles says, creates form on some level. So you wake up in the morning. We talk here constantly about the importance of the morning. Your mind is most open to receive new thoughts, new impressions. You disempower yourself when you go right to the news. You disempower yourself when you go right to the computer to see what's going on today. You disempower yourself when you just drink in a big, long, tall walk of, uh, a glass of water of worldly thought. You empower yourself by drinking in the thinking of God. The thinking of God, because your mind is a part of God's, which is what makes you holy. Your whole mind is your mind aligned with your source, which is God. That's why, remember, the Course in Miracles says five minutes spent with him in the morning is enough to guarantee he will be in charge of your thought forms throughout the day. Then you look out into the world, and instead of going, oh, God, I don't know what's going to happen, and the world is so messed up, and I don't know how I'm going to take it, and, which is basically just a complete sense of yourself as at the effect rather than at the cause of the life you live, you realize, I am a child of God. I don't have any more, any less than anyone else. But everybody just happens to have everything because God lives in us literally. And I am going out on this day as his messenger. I am going on this day, I have a function. If I have a sales call, if I have an audition, if I have a manufacturing job, if I am a receptionist, if I'm a doctor, if I'm a teacher, if I'm an artist, I have the same job to be a conduit for the love of God. Now, other people might not see that, and it is not incumbent upon me to tell them. In most situations, it's better not to, right? I think in my book, A Return to Love, remember I was just early days when I was doing it, I was reading The Chorus of Miracles and I was a cocktail waitress, and I remember this night when I went, oh, I get it, they think this is a bar. They think this is a bar, or they think this is a bookstore. They think this is a store. No, it's not. It's where children of God are meeting other children of God. And the circumstances of the mortal world is all just the setup where the lessons are provided, whereby people are brought together for the perfect teaching assignment, whereby the maximal teaching learning situations are provided for all the souls. So it could be a bar, it could be a store, it could be a movie set, it could be anywhere or anything. And your function within that is the same. And that is why we are taught every morning to say, where would you have me go? What would you have me do? What would you have me say and to whom? And that's why I love that part in that section. He needs your feet. He needs your hands. He needs your words. Now, 
Does that disempower you? Does that disempower you to say, okay, use me? God, just use me. Make me your messenger. Make me your conduit. Make me your teacher. And remember, to be a teacher, the Course in Miracles defines teaching as demonstration. So to be a teacher of God means that your function is to demonstrate love. So you might say, well, I don't know how to demonstrate love in that situation. And the answer is, are there people there? <laughs> are there any living things there? A, a wonderful thing, a woman I met the other night who is principal at a school, at a public school, and she was talking, she, you know, we were talking about the whole idea that you can't use religious language, which is understandable in public schools. And she said, we just do these exercises every day. We just send goodwill. We send our goodwill to all the people in the school. Well, nobody up there is going, oh, get the words right. So that's really wonderful. There's nothing here about the language. It's here about the commitment of the heart. So when you go into any situation wondering what you can get from it, to the extent to which you're wondering what you can get from it, first of all, you are by thinking, what can I get from this? You are by definition assuming that it's a world of scarcity and that the universe will not provide for you if you are not seeking to provide for yourself. Because why would I be in any situation wondering what I'm going to get from this unless I was already bringing into the moment and into the situation the idea that I didn't already have? But the way to manifest abundance is to know that you already have. Because if I have a thought I don't have enough, then no matter what I do, my core belief is that I don't have enough. But if I go into any situation, the sweet spot is finding that which is your abundance and knowing you have it and you are there to give it. But the abundance that you have in any situation may or may not be the material means or the material product of that situation. You might not have money. You might not have the whatever it is on a business level. But what you have is what you always have and you cannot lose. Like sometimes, let's say an actor, because here in Los Angeles there are a lot of people in the entertainment business. I'm an actor. I really, I, I hope I could get a sitcom this season. Right? I hope I could get a sitcom. I'm really hoping my agent, maybe my agent could get me a commercial. Maybe my agent could get me, you know, it's going to be pilot season. Well, there's certainly nothing, quote unquote, wrong with that thinking, but there's no way that that's high level. So high level would be art can change the world. Art is revolutionary. Real acting, great acting, great directing, great writing, great television, great film, literally affects the consciousness of a culture. May I be worthy, not that I'm not essentially worthy, but may my talents and my outer expression be lifted by God to such a level that I might contribute to those fields of power. You see the difference? You see how dense option A is? And then you're wondering why you live a small life. You're living a small life because you're living within a small mental construct that you yourself created. Now, it was handed to you, but it is up to us what we buy into. Now, on the other hand, if you recognize that whatever you are doing, and if you were doing anything, if you were, for instance, a salesperson, and you cannot think of a way that what you are selling could actually be of value, you shouldn't be selling it. By definition, you're out of integrity. So what you find is whatever you're doing, how could this bring comfort to someone? How could this bring an upliftment to someone? That is how powerful your mind is. The Course in Miracles says all thinking, all thought creates form on some level. So you wake up in the morning. The reason we do our lessons, the reason we meditate, the reason we pray, it's the battery charge, right? It's that battery charge, that reverberation. Then you go back into the world and you take with you out into the day the power and the empowerment 
and the peace that you got from God in the time of your prayer and your meditation. And if you are a student of A Course in Miracles, of course, you are going through the exercises which are a specific curriculum in the retraining of the mind to surrender the thought system of fear that dominates the planet and to accept instead a thought system of love. But A Course in Miracles itself says it's just one form of a universal curriculum. But to find the path that is actually to pray within yourself for that path that is true for you. And then, as we say here all the time, your spiritual exercise is no different than physical exercise. You do it in order to hone your attitudinal muscles. Then you go wherever you go, and you know that while it might appear to be an audition, it might appear to be a uh, business meeting, it might appear to be a classroom, it might appear to be a restaurant, that you were there for a function so much greater than would be defined by the mortal mind. You were not there as a waitress. You were not there as a teacher. You were not there as a receptionist. You were not there as a lawyer. You were not there as a doctor. You were not there as an artist. You were there as a messenger of God. You are there to participate in a revolution of love. I made a video a few months ago before we did the Sister Giant Conference called A Revolution of Love. It's on Marianne.com. Uh, I think you can just go to it on YouTube also, but it's definitely on Marianne.com. And it's a, it's a lovely video that... Uh, uh, Varda uh, Bakar made. Uh, I gave her my script and she was, she's wonderful that way. And to think of yourself at this profoundly urgent moment in human history as contributing to a field of energy, which is here, as is often said today, though I often wonder about some of the ways the word is used, to disrupt the energy of the current trajectories by which humanity is moving towards the future. And this can only work if it's a collaborative venture. And there is a way in which so much of what is happening on the planet represents a whole system's breakdown. And the only response, the only antidote to a whole system's breakdown is a whole system's response, which is another way of saying all hands on deck. This isn't going to happen without you playing your part. The Course in Miracles says nobody has the part you're assigned. Nobody can do your part but you. And so the Course in Miracles says the highly individualized curriculum, which is assigned to you because it's the way you learn your lessons, is also the way that you serve. So that which God would have you do because it is your response to praying that you might be used by him for good purpose, is the same thing as your greater gifts to the world. And there are, this is just one of many ways in which the ego mind would convince us that service to God is all well and good, but you have to take care of yourself. Service to God is all well and good, but you have to take care of number one. Service to God is all well and good, but some things you have to, you know, you have to figure out yourself. Well, remember, the spiritual mind is the mind that lies beyond reason. It lies beyond the rational. That doesn't mean it's irrational. It means it's non-rational. The Danish philosopher Kierkegaard said we must take a leap of faith. I was talking to someone yesterday, and I was giving her my feedback but I said, we are taught in, in Course in Miracles to make no decisions for ourselves. But the Holy Spirit does speak to you through your brothers. So definitely we listen to other people's opinion. We go for counsel. We seek intelligent feedback. But the bottom line is always what we feel within our gut in response to prayerful request. And it always has to do with the part of the mind that knows what's going to happen tomorrow in ways that we don't. I was talking to a friend on the phone last night, and he was supposed to fly to New York today from somewhere on the East Coast. 
And he just kept saying, I just don't want to go. I just don't want to go. And this is usually someone who's so happy because he's flying off to wherever he goes the next day. There was something in him. He just, he just didn't want to go. And it was a little disturbing to me. I said, are you sure that you should? Because it's unlike you that it's so, I just don't want to go. I just don't want to go. And sure enough, LaGuardia was all fogged in today and had to fly around for a couple of hours. Then they had to land in Washington, D.C., then they had to stay there for four hours because of all the fog in New York. And these things happen to us all the time. His subconscious mind knew something that his conscious mind could not. And this happens all the time. And is bound to happen as long as what all we think is, I got to figure out what I need to do. So the Holy Spirit does not diminish our brain cells. The Holy Spirit does not diminish our IQ. The Holy Spirit makes us stronger because our only desire is, how could I serve you best? How could I serve you best? And most of us have had situations in life, I know I have, where I didn't get because I was seeking to get. You only get what you're willing to give away. The Course in Miracles says that the gifts of the spirit are different than the spirit gifts of the material world. If I only have a certain number of pieces of pie and I give you a piece of pie, then there's less pie for me. But on the spiritual plane, only what I give to you do I get to keep. So if you're a teacher, what do you do? If you are a business person, what do you do? Before you go to work, you take five minutes to visualize wherever you're going to be. And some people might be saying, well, you know, once I get that part I want, this will be so cool. Once I get that job I want, this will be really cool. Don't wait till your life looks like what you think it ought to look like to realize your divine purpose. The CEO of some major company is not in God's eyes more worthy or have a more worthwhile function than does someone who at the moment does not have a job. Because your job as a messenger of God is the same, whether you don't have a job right now or whether you are head of, let's say, a movie studio. Because all of us, in essence, have the same job. And that is here to be ministers of God. This is, it means we are here in whatever situation we happen to be in. So in that situation that you happen to be in that you might think is a terrible situation because you don't even have a job right now, <clears throat> you encounter human beings. And if you encounter human beings, you have a job. If you encounter human beings, the Course in Miracles says, or even think of human beings, you encounter, you, you have a job. And so when we face life like that, with a sense of purpose, a sense of purpose that is not even determined by ourselves, that is not even directed by our mortal minds, but which comes from a surrender and an openness to be used by God in service of the healing of the world. This gives our minds power. Mental clarity, the Course in Miracles says you achieve so little because you have an undisciplined mind. Many, many years ago, I had an opportunity that I did not take and regretted for years. And I used to say to my best friend, I didn't even pray about it. I didn't even, and, and I was in a situation where I definitely could have said, could I, I, I definitely, anytime you could say, could I think about this? But I could have even said, could I pray about this? But my fear was so great. And the Course in Miracles says the ego speaks first and the ego speaks loudest. So you never have to worry that your spiritual orientation is going to leave you with less opportunity. You never have to worry that your spiritual orientation is going to leave you in a place of sacrifice and less abundance. Your spiritual orientation is your orientation of abundance. Because when the liver cell is assigned to the liver, that's because that's the best place for the liver cell to be. Not just because the liver cell is there to collaborate with other liver cells, but because that's what it essentially is. There are many, many cells in the body, but some are assigned to the liver. 
So the Course in Miracles says that when we do place something in the hands of God, often the voice we hear of the Holy Spirit will seem startling. Really? That's what you want me to do? Really? Don't go tomorrow? Really? Go there? Really do that? And once we realize that there is this quantum field that is beyond the mortal mind, not irrational but non-rational, then you gain what Martin Luther King called cosmic companionship. So when you go into any situation, before you go to work tomorrow, before you go look for a job tomorrow, whatever, you spend five minutes blessing, sending your love, sending your namaste consciousness to everyone you know you are going to meet that day and everyone that you don't know you're going to meet that day. If you're saying, oh, God, I have that sales meeting. Well, just know that God doesn't look at that sales meeting the way you do. My daughter once said to me, oh, I have to go away for the weekend and I, I really don't want to go. And I said, well, tell me about it. She said, well, you know, they're these really nice people, but I don't know there. And she started saying, you know, they just weren't the most exciting people she knew. And she talked about where they were going, and it wasn't her idea of the most exciting place to go. And then she said, because she's schooled in these things, and we discussed it, that you never know why you're going somewhere, and there is no such thing as a boring person. There are people who have not have, have, have not dug deep into themselves, but usually it's not even so much that is that you have not dug deep into even finding out who they are. And we talked about that. She knew that because she knew that to get out of it would appear unkind, that people were counting on her. And then she made a comment that was absolutely true. She said, well, the universe isn't going to give me a great weekend staying in town if it's based on my having turned my back on other people that are expecting something from me. I said, absolutely. And she had a fantastic time. And there were things about where they were going that she didn't even know was true, but it was perfect for stuff she was doing in school. And the fact that it was where it was and had her off the grid was exactly the kind of relaxation that she needed. All because she wasn't figuring out in advance where she thought she needed to be. As long as she knew that her only job was to show up for love, to show up ethical behavior, righteous behavior, to the extent to which it was clear to her, and to just be there in a state of love, and to listen to the voice within her. And it wasn't like this led her to a boring weekend. It led her to a fantastic one. So just in case it's true, why don't you try it this week? Just in case. Wake up in the morning. Think about wherever you're going to be. And no, you know, I always say children are excited when they wake up in the morning because they don't know what's going to happen today. You and I are bored and tired and weary when we wake up in the morning because we think we do. And if you think you know what's going to happen today, then guess what? It's probably going to happen exactly the way you think it is. But if you realize that everyone that is in your life on any level is Jesus in dread, Everybody we meet, if God is in anyone, God is in everyone. And to really think about what that means. And to know that we will receive the excitement, we will receive the beauty, we will receive the goodness, and we will receive the abundance in every body and in every situation to the extent to which we are there to see it, to hold it, and to give it. There is in traditional Christianity a phrase called the gifts of the Holy Spirit. You know, charisma is an inter interesting term. It, begins, it began as a spiritual term. It means of the spirit. Some people just have charisma. Well, that's not the case. People have charisma in, within whom a certain light switch is turned on. That light is within everyone. We are all lamps. Some people, however, are not plugged in. And so a perfect lamp, it doesn't matter the size of the lamp, it doesn't matter the shape of the lamp, 
or the design of the lamp. What matters is whether or not there's a light bulb, and all of us have that light bulb. Our house is wired for electricity, but it has to be plugged in. And every time you do a prayer like I'm mentioning, that means that your mind is literally connecting to your divine source. And you will be different than you would be had you not said that prayer that morning. Your nervous system is affected by this. The cells in your body, the molecular structure of your environment is affected by this. We all know what it is when a person walks into a situation, oh, they're just so negative, like, oh, that person walked in and everything got so dark and cynical and negative. We know that. And there are other people, it's like, oh, I just like her. You know, she's so positive. And then there is something way beyond that where somebody just has something. Well, all of us have something. And when we realize what it is we have, that it is God, not figuratively, but literally alive in us, asking that he might use our hands and that he might use our feet and that he might use our minds and that he might use our words knowing that in God's eyes there is no place where you could possibly go where there's not a way that you could be of service to a human being with a word, with a touch, with a thought. And this uplifts you. It uplifts your thinking, and then because it uplifts your thinking, it uplifts the vibrations of your relationships with other people, whether people are attracted to you, what they are attracted to you for, and so forth. So that is your function. And when you remember in any situation, who am I really and why am I here? I am a child of God. I am an idea in the mind of God, no more, no less than anyone else. All of the children of God are special. None of the children of God are special. I don't have anything other people don't have. You just know that, so you're not trying to run any games or posture. You realize that to the extent you just dwell within that space, knowing who lives within you, asking where would you have me go, what would you have me do, what would you have me say, and to whom, before you go into any situation blasting whoever's going to be there with love, both the people you know are going to be there and the people you don't even know are going to be there, then you are going to be dwelling in some other place. You are going to be a disciple that day. Remember, the word disciple comes from the same root as the word discipline. Remember that in the Gospel of Thomas, when Jesus said to his disciples, go out into the countryside and teach the gospel. He didn't mean go out into the countryside, hit people over the head with our book. That's not what he meant. Teach means to demonstrate, and gospel means love. And the disciples said to him in the Gospel of Thomas, if we do that and we go out into the countryside, what will we say? And he said, I will tell you when you get there. A Course in Miracles says you will be told everything you need to know. It will not even just be that you will be told what words to say. It won't even matter as much as the place you're coming from when you say them. And if your intent in any situation is to be there, praying that you be used as a messenger, as a conduit, just as the faucet, you're not the water, then such miracles will happen through you that when you leave the room, other people will say, I don't know. There's just something about them. They will know what it is, but you will. Thank you very much. Richard, you want to come on? <clears throat> Thank you. All right, so this is where you give your own subconscious mind that knows everything the opportunity to light up, to reflect on your own life, to deliver you to your own wisdom. One of the things that we, we remember here is when you are in a room full of people, and those of you on live stream, you are in this room in terms of the energetic field, it's very difficult to lie to yourself. So really listen deeply to yourself because the kinds of messages and answers that you are receiving while you're in this field, they mean something. And a lot of times 
It's not so much that we don't have wisdom, it's that we don't listen to our own wisdom. So let's do that right now. We close our eyes and in so doing, open to the light which is within. And herein we dwell with God. And here in this sacred place, we are renewed. We feel the Spirit of God pouring forth upon us. A divine elixir of light now pouring forth upon your head. Entering now into your body, the light traveling through your brain, throughout your head, your neck, your torso, the light now traveling down through your arms, your lower arms, your hands, your fingers. the light now traveling through every organ, every muscle, and every bone, the light now traveling through your eyes, your nose, your mouth, your ears, your skull, your hair, your skin, your heart, your lungs, your liver, your spleen, your abdomen, the light running through your blood, through your bones, your lower torso, your genitals, your thighs, continuing down through your back, your buttocks, down your knees, your lower legs, your ankles, your feet, your toes, the light now drunk in by every thirsty cell. As every cell is renewed, every organ is invigorated. The light does not stop at the confines of your skin. The light extends outward beyond your skin. Your body itself illumines, your body itself filled with light, your body itself renewed in purpose. The Holy Spirit now pouring forth your mind, your body, your spirit, casting out all dysfunctional thoughts, all dysfunctional feeling, all dis-ease of any kind. The water of spirit now pouring forth upon your mind and your body all aligned and realigned with the thinking and the love of God. And now feeling yourself as newly revitalized and illumined, we look now upon our lives As an illumined being, look at your job. As an illumined being, look at your family. As an illumined being, look at your friendships. As an illumined being, look at all around you. And pour forth from this light now within you all your love, the Spirit of God flowing through you, moving through you. Blast that love at your employer, at your colleagues, at your associates, your co-workers, your employees, your friends, your mate, your lover, your exes, all whom you love, all 
all those you do not love, all those you like, all those you do not like. Blast this love at your parents wherever they are. Send this love to your children wherever they are. Send this love and light to everyone else who is in the room wherein you sit. Send this love and light to everyone and all living things in the country wherein you dwell. Send this love and light to all living things upon the earth. Send this love and light to all those who ever lived, to all those who live, and all those who shall one day live. Send the love and light that is who and what you are out into the furthest regions of the universe and the universes. As a child of love, know and remember such is the power within you to bless, to restore, and to heal all of life. Send your love to heal the wounded earth. Send your love to heal the war-torn regions of the world. Send your love to heal and to bless all who suffer. And send your love to God who shares his with you. <clears throat> and now we pray that the imprint of this divine memory of who we are and why we are here be firmly placed upon our minds. Angels gathered round to protect us from the lure of forgetfulness. That when we open our eyes and return to the world, we shall have received and now shall permanently keep a deeper knowledge of who we are and why on earth we are here. Thank you, God, for your faith in us, who you created in your image.
so may we behave. And so it is, together, we all say, And Richard Learmont, thank you. Thank you, Richard, darling. <clears throat> okay. I have a few questions, as I had said to those of you on live stream. I'm, I'll try to get to those, and then let me see how we are in time. We're fine. I'm going to take some of these, and then I will come down. <clears throat> I was parented by a psychopath who served as a World War II, in World War II as a navigator in the Army. He and his crew dropped many bombs over Africa. He received an honorable discharge due to medical illness issues. He was diagnosed with schizophrenia. I am 54 years old. I am the eighth child of nine. My dad was hospitalized for nine months when I was three years old. Upon his discharge, my mother worked full time, and I was left in my father's care when my siblings were at school. My father never stayed on medication and lived in the family home until he left when I was 17. As an adult, I went to therapy and thought I had adequately dealt with my childhood traumas. Then several years ago, I was in a car accident and suffered a minor traumatic brain in injury. I have been on disability since the accident, continuing in physical and other therapies to regain my health. When the collision occurred, it was as if all that I had worked so hard on counseling to contain suddenly burst open. I pray for love, light, forgiveness, and healing. I pray to be healed at depth that I may glorify God. Yet still I get so frightened reliving old memories. I start and end my day with a gratitude list, though I do not generally maintain feelings of gratefulness throughout the day. I can hardly stand to go to trauma therapy. I do a chunk of work and think I'm done with the memories, and then more horror comes. Sometimes I can be the observer. I see that the accident has given me time to heal spiritually and emotionally. I doubt the brain injury is related to the accident, but rather related to repeated traumas. It is impossible to focus, read well, and process information while digesting trauma of any type. I believe I will recover fully if I tend to the traumas of my childhood, forgive, and find compassion for the abused child within. I just seem to fall off the cliff and often forget I am the observer and re-traumatize myself. If this email reaches you, I would love any advice you have. I feel so lost and spacey. I do exercises to get grounded, but mostly I wish I could just leave this body and fly back home. I have three wonderful daughters, and I will not cause them pain by intentionally leaving my physical body. Being committed to staying does not stop me from wishing to leave this tortured body. I'm often moved to tears when I read your work. Thank you for the blessings and so forth. This is from Jenny. So Jenny, I hope that you are watching now. So let me just say a couple of things uh, about the things that you've said in terms of how the Course in Miracles looks at these things, and then I, I, all of us will now pray for Jenny. Within the three dimensions, Jenny, what you experienced is very real. But these three dimensions are themselves not ultimate reality. So no matter what your father in his schizophrenic state might have done to you or to your siblings, the real you was not touched. And so there is a level on which we want to give this trauma less respect. Yes, it happened. And people are traumatized every day. But there are people who are destroyed by their traumas, and there are people who survive them intact. And through the grace of God, you can be one who survives them intact. Right now, your mind is giving more power to the trauma than to, the power, than to, the, to God who can and will heal you of your trauma. And so we talk about that all the time, don't we? The idea that you can have more, you have faith in your disaster or do you have faith in God to heal you and to uplift you? So we don't 
here, those of us who are your spiritual companions, who have heard your story and are about to pray with you, we will not enroll in your understandable tendency to give so much power to these traumas. That's not to say that we in any way minimize their import in your life. That's not to in any way invalidate your feelings. But it is to validate that, as the Course in Miracles says, there is no order of difficulty in miracles. We do not believe in a God who's saying, Jenny, I'd love to help you, but your father, my hands are tied. God is more powerful than your father's schizophrenia. That, that's really the essence. And so we believe in miracles here. So when you said something here about I need to tend to the trauma, to be honest, it sounds to me like you've tended to the trauma plenty. Let's tend now to our ability to accept that God is all-powerful and that through a miraculous alchemy, which is God within you, you shall be lifted. You shall have a happy life. God himself will wipe away all tears. And in ways that you cannot even imagine, you will actually have a life of greater service and even greater love and peace because of the deliverance that you have experienced through the grace of God. So let us all, who, and I'm sure that all of us are touched by Jenny's story, let's pray for her now. <clears throat> Dear God, we know <clears throat> that you know this woman, Jenny. You know her situation well. And we know that you know, dear God, anyone else who is joined in this prayer now who suffers a similar kind of trauma or wound. And we pray, dear God, that you place your hand upon Jenny and upon anyone else who so needs this. And may she and they be lifted up above and beyond the grip, the grasp, of the horrors of her past. May all that is and was not love <clears throat> now dissolve in her thinking and go back into the nothingness from whence it came. May the Holy Spirit so pour forth upon her, upon her daughters, upon her family, such light that darkness shall be no more such love that fear shall be no more. Dear God, breaks the chain, dear God, that binds Jenny to memories that reenact her horror. Free her to the truth of who she is right now and forevermore. And so it is together we all say amen. <clears throat> I am addicted to a married man. It's a young marriage, no children involved. We kissed the first time a half a year after their marriage. <laughs> Timeline is so important. <laughs> it's an, off, an on off relationship for over one year now. But two weeks ago, I decided for myself that it's enough, as many times before. Although I feel the difference between loving and honoring him from my true self, I am having these flashbacks filled with the amazing kisses and sex we had. I feel torn between what is allowed and what I desire. There is intimacy between us not only on the physical level. He is a really good friend and we're also working together. I love my job and the team. That's why I'm still there. He will be my boss soon. <laughs> Your reactions are just priceless. <clears throat> I asked for a miracle, but maybe I didn't want to hear the answer. I guess it's about my wall against love. So far too often I'm running away from lovable, available men. But how can I let go from wanting to kiss, to touch, to smell, and to feel him? How can I appreciate the physical intimacy we had without wanting it again? 
asking for a miracle extending the distance at the same time. I am tired of running. Thank you in advance for helping. It would be an honor if you would come to Germany one day. God bless you and your people, you and yours too, Alexia. Okay, so there is a, a in, in general, there is a good way to express your love for a married man. Leave town. Um, this, uh, in this case, I understand that you work for him. Now, seriously, let's, let's talk about this. There are people who have open marriages. Uh, so that in some situations, you know, they don't have a monogamous situation. The description here makes you think they do. And so the first thing you think about is this man's wife. Right? So there's really no way around this in terms of knowing what's correct. Now, you've had, this woman has had physical contact with this man. And so she's chemically, you know, all of that stuff we now know about all the things that happen in the brain. She's had sex with him. So she's already chemically connected. We know how all that works. We know how, it, how evolution has planned it. <clears throat> how one of the ways that the species propagates is because over millions and millions of years, once a woman has had, a sex, had sex with a man, she would like him to stay, to take care of children and all of that. So if you did not work with this man, I would highly recommend what I know I used to hear Pat Allen talk about a 30-day fast, uh, not hearing his voice, not touching him, not seeing him. All those things are... Very, very uh, good idea. In any situation, whether you've been married to him or for any other reason, you need to stop this because it's not healthy, it's not righteous, it's not good. In this case, you've got a situation on your hands because you would like to stay working there. But you want to be very careful. Um, he's married. And everything we do has a consequence. So... If you, you know, part of what's slightly disturbing about this letter to me is you don't seem convinced yourself. And I can't convince you. I can just reflect back to you from spiritual principle. If you are going, if you really know in your heart that you should not have anything to do with this man sexually, which I hope you will because he is a married man, and, and if, if these agreements don't mean anything, and I don't, I don't say this from a prudish place, nor I... Do I say this from a place of a woman who's not lived quite a life? So, but there's no really way around this one. So if you, you, the first thing you need to do is you need to pray and ask God if you're supposed to still work there. That's the first thing. You know, we say here all the time, what you place on the ha in the hands of God, when you place something in the hands of God, you're placing your thinking about it. So the first question is, are you even supposed to be in that job? And if you were supposed to be in that job, and you have come to the realization that as long as he's married, there's really no, there's no further discussion on that one, unless he's in an open marriage, which clearly he's not, or you would have mentioned this, and he would have mentioned it. Then you, if you were to stay there, you are going through something no different than anybody in this room or watching right now has been through. You know, once you have sex with someone, all kinds of chemical stuff happens. So, and I, and I also doubt that the woman who wrote this is the only person in this room who is thinking that becoming chemically disconnected from someone might be a very good idea. So we are going to pray now. And as we pray with this woman, we're going to do a visualization which I read about many years ago that is so powerful. I think it is. And that's where you see whatever dysfunctional chords might bind you to another person. And you actually see Jesus coming with the scissors of light. And if you don't see Jesus, if you see an angel or whatever you see, but this idea of a scissors of light, because with your mortal mind and your chemical connection to him, you yourself can't cut it off. And so either you're going to leave or you're going to stay in that job and if you stay in that job, you're either going to continue to have sex with him or you're going to break it off. 
If you continue to have sex with him, then you've got a whole karmic thing going on there that, that you, you want to think very deeply about. And if you want to cut it off, it sounds like maybe you need a miracle. And for that, we now pray. Does that make sense? Okay, let's pray. <clears throat> Dear God, we know that you know the woman who wrote this. And we know that you know her attachment and her connection to the man wherever she speaks. And we join with her as she places this relationship in your hands. Dear God, align her thinking, align her feeling, and align her body with all that is righteous and good and true. We join with her now as she prays for him. She prays for his wife. She atones in her heart for any harm she might have caused to either of them or to herself. She prays that her relationship with this man as well as his relationship with his wife might now be lifted to divine right order. Dear God, please guide her whether or not she should remain at this job. And now, dear God, whatever dysfunctional cords of body or mind or spirit or heart now connect her to this man. <clears throat> we now see within as you yourself, dear God, now cut these cords. And for any of us here who are dysfunctionally attached, sexually or otherwise, to another human being, we too now pray that God will cut all darkened cords and dissolve all diseased connections that our relationships might all be holy and good and beautiful and true. And so it is, together, we all say, amen. <clears throat> all right, I think that what I'm going to do now is come down and, uh, yeah, okay, I'm going to come down to uh, the audience here. We can talk about anything you want to talk about. Uh, raise your hand and uh, I'll do my best. Uh, one thing I, we do want to remind, we start with things uh, to which the Course in Miracles is relevant. Okay, some gentlemen in the back there? Yes. <clears throat> yes, sir. The message thing tonight was awesome. I really enjoyed that. and um, saw You know what? I can't hear you, babe, so I'm coming down. Give me just a minute. Okay, start again. Um, the message or your talk tonight was really great. Um, Thank you. As far as having a message and, you know, trying to determine what your message okay. is. Okay. <clears throat> and uh, so, you know, I went to the Sister Giant thing and talked to you there, and uh, Jank Huger was there talking mm -hmm. about the convention stuff. Mm -hmm. and, um, Wolfpack. Wolfpack and stuff. Mm -hmm. And um, so, so in the summer of 2009, I drove out to Austin, Texas for the Daily Coast um, uh, webinar. Or, I've uh, lived there. Yeah, and uh, Larry Lessig was there. Uh -huh. And he had Who a I will be speaking with on June 4th. Yeah. Okay. And he had, a, he had a website called Fix Congress First, and, um, and I'd been talking about this convention thing up until that point. So I said, I'm going to go out there and I'm going to talk to him and say, hey, if, you're, if you want to fix Congress, you've got to call a convention because okay. Congress is not going to self-correct itself. And it's even gotten a lot worse since then because now we have all this private money in there in the system. So, uh, so he, um, he gave me his email, we stayed in touch, and then in 2010, he was at Stanford, and I drove up to speak to him again about the convention clause. And then in 2011, he went back to Harvard, and he actually held a conference at Harvard with a whole bunch of people from the right and the left talking about this constitutional convention. Yeah, because uh, the Tea Partiers are 
want to overturn Citizens United too. I mean, it's a really right-left thing. It's it's an American issue, right. not a right-left issue. Uh, yeah, I like to say nonpartisan. A lot of people say bipartisan. It's, it's a non -partisan Transpartisan, issue, right? they say these days. Yeah. So, uh, so, um, so he had the conference there in 2011. We talked about it more. I need you to get to the thing because I've got to get to yeah, Course yeah. in Miracles. Okay, it was right, right there. The next, one, uh, the next plot point was um, uh, he. So yeah, so we have to, So then you uh, had your sister giant and stuff, and I said, well, gosh, Mary Ann should know about the convention clause, and and you you're, you that was brought to your attention by Jink Uger mm -hmm. and, and those guys. Mm -hmm. So now you're going to go talk to him here uh, in a couple of days in Seattle. So the big idea is that just this year, the congressional or the um, House Judiciary Committee is now starting to count the applications for this convention, and yeah, yeah. You, so so the whole thing is is. I mean, you're super smart, he's super smart, and we need people on the left to say, hey, we are going to put our hand out to the people on the right, and we're all going to go together to this convention and find out what we can agree on. And that's... Yeah, that's I think that, that you know, this is clearly a movement happening. There's Schenck Ugar, there's Wolfpack, there's Move to Amend, there's uh, the New Hampshire Rebellion. Uh, this is in the air. Now, I know when I ran for Congress, the whole thing was about seeing uh, the undue influence of money in politics as the cancer underneath all the cancers. Uh, I think there's been a movement in the last two years even. I think more and more you get mainstream realization. I think people realizing this is absurd. We're not even a democracy anymore. We're an oligarchy and it's more about money than it's about actual democracy. I think I'm feeling positive in that sense. I think that this is not like an odd topic anymore. What you're talking about is strategy. You know, should it be a, the, should it be the people in Congress uh, with the Constitutional Convention? Should it be in the states and other people? I mean, this is all strategy issues. And I think that a lot of people, Lawrence Lessig has his ideas of how it should be. Um, Tom Hartman has his ideas. I'm sure Bernie Sanders has his ideas. I mean, a lot of people have their ideas, and and this is good. This is how it should work. Um, I'm, going, I'm coming there as a guest invited by Larry and the New Hampshire Rebellion. So mine isn't going to be a strategy conversation. The, the, the piece that I feel I bring really has to do with people really seeing the larger context philosophically about why democracy matters and why the idea of voting being free of undue influence of money matters. So I'll just, I'll bring that part, the part that I feel like I can play. But I know how passionate you are about this. The only thing I would say to you that might be might be helpful to you because I've heard you speak before. I think sometimes we disserve ourselves by failing to align with people who are already doing the kinds of things that we want to see happen. And so I would hope for you that you, that you might find that, that you would experience yourself as a little bit less of a lone wolf on this. Because it, it seems that there's a struggle there that it would seem to me you would not feel so much if, if you felt that one of those organizations was actually standing for what you care about so that you can feel you're part of the larger team. Because I think all of us want to feel we're part of a collaborative effort at whatever it is we're trying to effort at. Does that make sense? Uh, if, it's, if it's helpful. Yeah, I mean, I, I, I just... I, 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 Maybe there was a lone wolf thing in the past, but now it is not a fringe issue anymore. There You're are right. It's not fringe. Everybody's it. talking and about so, it for good yeah, reason. So I, I just, I just want to come down today to say, hey, you know, the ball's still rolling forward right. for us, and I just wanted right. to back that up. Thank you. So Thanks. I get it. Thank you very, very much. Okay. Course in Miracles, guys. Okay. First and foremost. Yes. Okay. A couple people back there, and then I'll come to you, sir. Yes. <clears throat> yes. Hi. Um... I've been doing uh, the course. I'm on day 76. Okay. And I've hit a big roadblock. Okay. I, I did it yesterday. And okay. I, uh, it's the one that says, um, I am under no laws but God's. Okay. And um, two parts. One, I keep struggling with. Um, did every... you write me about this in an email? I did not. Okay, because somebody else did, okay. so I'm glad you're bringing it up. Um, I struggle with frequent migraines like every couple weeks. Okay. And also uh, <clears throat> uh, a back issue. Okay. And so I struggle with the. Um, you know, the, the body, the physical part okay. of that kind of law. Right. And then also about the nutrition as okay. far as um, reconciling my beliefs about, you know, exercising and right. eating healthy and Excellent all that. question. And, and I'm, I'm so glad you brought it up because it was one of them and I wish that I had okay. taken it. So thank you. Excellent and an important question. 
The Course in Miracles does say, and it's one of those powerful lessons, I am under no laws but God's. And it does refer to, you know, because we talk about the laws of economics or the laws of nutrition, and, and as, as you were saying, you know, well, what about that? So this is an important part of the course. And how many of you have either a background in or a basic understanding of Christian science? N not many. Okay. So Christian science philosophically is very much like A Course in Miracles, in that its message is that spirit is real and matter is not. And people who are very, very um, firm Christian scientists will sometimes say, therefore you cannot take medicine. Because if you take medicine, you are affirming the reality of the disease and only spirit is real, right? A Course in Miracles, this is where the Course in Miracles really differs from uh, Christian science. Because A Course in Miracles says, the Holy Spirit enters in at the level of your belief. So the Course says, you obviously believe in magic or the reality of matter, or you would not have gotten sick. Therefore, the Holy Spirit enters in the form of medicine. Does that make sense? So it's still God. And I tell a story. I think, I don't know, did I tell it in Return to Love? I can't remember. But it was very early in my career. And I, how many of you have heard this story and going, I should go and tell that story again? About me when I had the throat thing? How, okay, how many have heard it? Because I, okay, then I'm going to tell it and you'll just you'll file your nails or something. Um, because it was such an interesting demonstration to me. So, had you heard it? That's important. Have you heard this story? I have heard it, yes. Okay, then never mind. I'm well, not going there. But the well, point just, is, just in other point. words, if there is migraine medicine. Yes. Okay. The point is, if there is migraine medicine, and you, if you do this, this, this lesson, I am under no laws but God's, and you still have a migraine, and there's, by the way, I think t I've heard tapping is really good. Okay. The, for, for migraines, I've heard really good things about that. If you still have a migraine, just know whether it's tapping or it's migraine medicine or whatever, it comes from God. Okay. Do you see what I'm saying? I do. So it's not contrary. It's entering in at the level of your belief system. Yes. And then sometimes I wonder though, then I'm like, is there something, what am I, what am I missing spiritually that I'm maybe inviting these things into me? Like, does it make sense? Like even this morning, like I was at the gym and then this old injury I've had for like seven years went out out of nowhere. And, you know, ironically enough, on the day that I'm learning there, are, I'm under no laws but God's. And the next thing you know, like I couldn't move my neck. I had to go to the chiropractor, physical therapy, all this. And I, it makes me wonder if I'm, if I'm missing something spiritually that's causing these things to happen. If I'm Was not there the any lesson. way in which your behavior at the gym was not as careful with your body as it might have been? I was pushing myself, but I, don't, I wasn't doing anything out of the ordinary. I was with a trainer. Okay. What is your name? Brent. Let's pray. Okay, thank you. Okay. Let's pray with Brent. I think you want to be careful with this, what did I do to attract this line of thinking? It's more, the, the miracle thinking is, now that it is here, what is the miracle? Where is the miracle? Because there is no spot where God is not, as they say. And among other things, remember, prayer is the medium of miracles. So it's not what did I do to create this, it's what, how can I join with God to end this? Does that make sense? Okay, let's pray with Brent, and I'm sure that Brent is not the only person uh, here or on live stream who has a physical issue uh, that you desire healing for. Let's pray. <clears throat> Dear God, we know that you know Brent, you know his migraines, you know how he reenacted an injury today and triggered the muscle pain and now for Brent or for anyone else here that is either experiencing physical pain or thinking of someone else who is, we now see upon Brent 
and we see upon anyone else included in this prayer the hand of the divine physician. And as Jesus or the divine physician by any other name now touches Brent upon his shoulders and touches Brent upon his head, any area where love and light of God does not now flow, flows now. And we see the healing penetration of the light of God upon Brent's body, entering into his mind and his body and his spirit, as into everyone else now included in this prayer. And Brent is healed. And all pain dissolves as he relaxes now into the arms of God. Dear God, please take away his migraines. Take away his pain. And so it is. Together, we all say, amen. Okay. In the back there. <clears throat> Hi. Hi. Everybody. Um, okay, I'm having a little bit of a conflict between two things that I believe and two things we've kind of covered. And it's, I definitely believe that um, my subconscious mind knows when things are going to happen. But I also believe that I can kind of create something by overthinking it. And so currently, I'm struggling because I've reached a, a level of success that I. I believe I helped him to manifest by positive thinking and positioning myself and all of that. Now I've reached it. I'm so happy. But I have this feeling inside about um, it ending. And it's frustrating me because I want to stop thinking about it because I don't want to create it by overthinking it. But then I'm like, or is it me, my subconscious, knowing it and trying to prepare myself, or is it me thinking about it going to create it? Do you understand? <clears throat> Does that make sense? Yes. Okay. Well, at least this makes sense to you. It makes sense to me. Um, okay. It will end. No form remains. And your attachment to the form, what you're now defining as your success, what is causing a problem here is your attachment to it. So hold it lightly. And you were here for the whole lecture tonight, right? Your only desire is to be of service. Your attachment to what form that is, what it looks like, will cause you to suffer. Now the good thing about realizing that all things are temporary is that in a way it will make you more responsible towards the experience while it's happening. Do you know what I'm saying? You, there will be a beauty in knowing, grab this moment, because no moment is ever the same. And knowing that it's all part of a flow, so you have surrendered yourself, you've prayed to be used, you will be used. Sometimes it will be in the form that you've now called forth, sometimes it might be in another form, and even more importantly, even if that form does, is discontinued, your service to God and to the world, like we were talking about tonight, will be no less. So that's why all attachment is very Buddhist, actually. Any attachment to form will cause you to suffer. And that's why you're afraid of it ending. The problem is not whether it ends. The problem is your attachment to it remaining. Yeah, and I'm barely enjoying it anymore. Exactly. I'm That's how the ego it. operates. And I, and I know that I have to stop, and I'm praying, and I'm meditating, and I'm doing everything you I can. You know, and it's last week, the, were you here last week? Because the talk was about surrendering the future. And he says one of the lessons in the course is, I place the future in the hands of God. As much as possible, you want to empty yourself. It's none of your business what it is. It's none of your business how long it lasts. The grasping mind is not the powerful mind. That's the ego mind. It will, it's the, the mind that keeps things from happening. It's the mind that cares too much what it looks like. Yeah. And that is the mind that keeps us in suffering. 
So lighten up. Whatever God wants is all you want. And the form that things take will have nothing to do with whether or not you're able to enjoy the ride. Because like you said, it's happening and you're not enjoying it. Because now that it's happened, you're worried it's going to leave. Yeah. Does that make sense? It does, but do you have any t tips on how to lighten up? Because yes. I feel like yes. I want to. <laughs> okay. And I even look at myself in the mirror yeah. and say, hey, yeah. girl. It's called A Course in Miracles. <laughs> <laughs> okay, <laughs> right. <laughs> Thank you. Yes, yes. I apologize. I, uh, I've been driving all over town and without getting into trouble. With Is your mic on, ma'am? I don't know. <laughs> Just put it closer to your mouth. I have stage fright. Testing one. <laughs> um, let's see. You've been driving all over town. Rabbi Barron is my rabbi. We cool. haven't had a chance to meet, but I'm aware of your work. Um, how do I say this without getting into trouble? Do you believe that Nazis are actively after Jews in 2015? Do you believe that? Well, it's 2015, but yes, I do. Would you believe that I may be public enemy number one because of who I am? You're a Nazi? <laughs> they th no, because of who I am, my heritage, they're after me and you, my family. You mean because you're Jewish? Well, because I'm Jewish royalty. Jewish royalty? As in David. Well, Michael, Mordechai. So what, what do you, I'm not sure what you're asking me. Um, there's a court date, which I can't talk about, but it's going to be okay, but I'm going through the trial of my life. I'm my mother's near death. I've been near death. I go to Kaiser daily, weekly. It's been going on since January, and I just need all the good prayers. We and will be glad to do that. What is your name? Ilona. Joy. Ilona. Okay. Ilona, Jeff, would you please put Ilona on the prayer list? And we will absolutely pray with you. Okay. All right. Michael, I see you, and I see this lady right here. How about this lady right here, and then down to Michael. <clears throat> okay. Hi. Hi. I, I appreciate... Uh, Is your mic on? I don't know what's going on here tonight. It's just not... It's kind of weak. Can you turn up this mic for... Us? Okay. Thanks. He's going to turn it up. Okay. <clears throat> uh, I appreciate your com the combination that, of uh, spirituality and frankness that you have. So Thank I thought you. I'd throw this question at you um, for myself and for a number of other people who are my age going through more or less the same thing. Um, having great interest and devotion to uh, wanting to put, affect change. Put in the, the mouth, uh, oh, okay. your mouth. Okay. Um, I know a great many people who are deeply interested in affecting greater change okay. in the world and are talented and okay. wonderful souls. Okay. What they struggle with is <clears throat> figuring out how best to align their human talents with fi finding the right role for themselves in okay. the world. And I know that that is a life's work, um, but I would love to hear what you have to say about making your way in that the doubts that come along, um, not knowing which opportunities to take, and how much to assert yourself to create roles for yourself. Okay. You were here for the lecture? <laughs> I completely failed with you, clearly. <laughs> okay. <clears throat> so what I apparently did not say, let me say now. <clears throat> Remember when I was talking tonight about how the liver cell, there's a natural intelligence that works through, so, so you've got an egg and you've got a sperm, and then all these other cells begin to emerge. And they make brains and hearts and spleens and livers and toes and fingernails and all that. And there's a natural intelligence working through every cell and assigning it to where it belongs, okay? There is a natural intelligence. Remember when I talked tonight about the singer who was afraid that if she surrendered her career to God, that he'd want her to be an accountant? So there is a natural intelligence at work inside all of us. There is in the mind of God, just as within the acorn, there is the architectural blueprint of an oak tree. <clears throat> within the DNA of the sperm and the egg, there is the architectural blueprint for the baby. And all the cells at work in your body right now, how do those cells know? how to make your heart beat? How do those cells know how to digest your food? How do those cells know 
how to breathe. And how do we know how to become what we are? I was getting there. <laughs> so the idea here is that there is a difference between those cells and you and me. And that's that you and I can say no. And in the body, when a cell turns away from the guidance as to its natural functioning, that's called cancer. And it is a malignancy. So what's happening on the planet is a spiritual malignancy has led us to disconnect from the, from the prayer that we simply serve the whole. And so when you pray, as I was saying, so if you have a talent, it may ask what field you're in or what your talent or what is your desire, it's something about what kind of field. I'm a writer. A writer. Uh, do you write, want to write fiction? Do you want to write in the entertainment industry, movies, TV, fiction, nonfiction, what kind of stuff? Well, I guess like any writer, my goal is to propagandize, but in a way that people don't realize it's propaganda. Well, I hope you mean for love, <laughs> yes. for the purposes of love, because the word propagandize usually means something else. <laughs> and what we were talking about tonight is a revolution of love. And that's and any day spent not contributing to the revolution is a waste of your time. It's a revolution of love. And to the extent to which you simply ask, Use my talents. Use my abilities. Use all that I am, all that I have, and knowing is everything we were talking about tonight. You're no more or less inwardly potentially talented than anyone else. And the more you make that prayer and that everything I was talking about tonight, your line of thinking, you will find yourself led. How does that cell know to turn into a, a liver? But how does the acorn know how to turn into an oak tree? How does the bud know how to blossom? And so as long as that's the clarity of your thinking, you will find yourself in the connections, in the educational, in the, in the experiences that either show you what you want or what you don't want. All you want to pray is, make me a great writer so I can serve you best. Tell me what to read. Tell me what to, to be around. Tell me what to observe. Tell me what I can learn. Tell me how to grow for your sake to glorify you. And the more that's your thinking, then that's where you'll be. And the only other thing I want to say is it has nothing to do with your age, because I promise you, everybody here has that same desire, those who are younger than you and those who are older than you. Does that make sense? Thank you. OK, thank you. OK. Um, OK, Michael, and then down there. Yes. And we, I understand now why we have to be careful about time. Okay. I'll be real quick, Marianne. <laughs> Michael, the, the gentleman you were speaking about, I would like to extend a gift. If you will email me and tell me anything that he would love to do, go to Sir Restaurant, go wherever it well, is. Well, he's too sick to go to a restaurant. Okay, well, he's whatever very it Ill. is, if it's a big basket of lovely okay. things, Jeff, I want to know what it is, Jeff. Email me and I'll deliver it to you next Monday. That's so sweet. Jeff, will you handle that? Sure. Okay, thank you. Thank you. you. And I have one more thing to Marianne. Yes. And then I would like to thank you for, we had a collaborative. And by the moment. way, from what I understand, to pay for the treatment is really Michael's. Isn't that right, Jeff? That, I mean, he, he Okay, well then I will do that. But I was just trying to make it a little bit more personal. Yeah. Um, but there was a great experience that happened in this room a few weeks ago. There was a lady sitting down, Cassidy was sitting down here, uh -huh. and she said she was going to go to China. Yeah, yeah, uh-huh. He's here. Fantastic. There's been a breakthrough. So thank you, everybody in the room. Thank you, Marianne. Thank yeah, you. Yeah, I remember when she was talking about Isn't that great? We pray together and, yes, yes. Okay, five, 10 minutes, because I found it last week in terms of the Saban, why it is we really do have to stick to the 930 thing. Yes, okay, yes, a uh, gentleman over there and then a lady down here, yes. Um, I'm just wondering, in regards to what you were saying about waking up in the morning and doing your meditation and inviting God's spirit in, and then you go out into the world, and whether it's at work, whatever it is, a person, a place, or a thing kind of pulls you out of that, pulls you out of your flow, right. and then before you know it, you're remembering something your mom said to you when you were two and it's ruining right. your day and your week. That bitch. Exactly. How do you stop that steam <laughs> before it gets okay. there? Well, once again, that's why the morning is so important. If you had, this is important, if you had done your lesson in the morning or whatever your meditation is, the chances of that happening are greatly diminished. That's number one. Because remember, even five minutes spent with the Holy Spirit in the morning. That's number one. If you have done your meditation in the morning, the chances of it happening are greatly diminished. Number two, even if it happens, the chances of you picking up your phone 
and calling her and saying something you shouldn't, you really don't want to say, or just even the, the chances of your lingering on it too long. That's the thing. I mean, I'm not saying if we do our meditations in the morning, we have no neurotic thoughts throughout the day. We have no unhealed thoughts. In fact, sometimes it might be that that's what's coming up for forgiveness. But the, the spirit gives us power within ourselves, pre literal, literal presence of mind. So that sometimes it's not that we don't have the sick thinking, but we, from having done the work of reading and doing the meditations, we are capable of not acting on it. And it doesn't become obsessive and crazy. It's something that's there, we're healing, but we're not in that complete crazy place where we're obsessing about it and we have no impulse control and God knows who we might call and what we might say and do. Does that make sense? Okay. Yes, down here. <clears throat> Is there... The spirit, does it recognize fear and does it recognize love? That's a great question. Okay, does it recognize fear? Does the spirit recognize fear and does it recognize love? I'm going to answer the second question first. Does it recognize love? Recognize. It not only recognizes love, it is love. The spirit is love. Does it recognize fear? Let me tell you why that's such an interesting question. It doesn't because to it, it knows fear does not exist. If it doesn't exist, where does it come from? It's a hallucination we're all having. So what the Course in Miracles says is that love is all that is. Love is all that is real. Love is the mind of God. And we are ideas in the mind of God. So when we are thinking with love, i.e. thinking with God, we're doing what we came here to do, we are being our true selves. And what is all-encompassing can have no opposite. Free will means we can think whatever we want to think. When we think with love, we are being who we are. When we think without love, because love is all that is real, we are actually not thinking. We are hallucinating. So the whole mortal realm, it's like Buddha called it an illusion. All the mortal realm of suffering and horror is actually a mass hallucination. Now that doesn't mean it doesn't matter because we're suffering here. So this is not in The Course in Miracles a reason to ignore it. It's a reason to transform it. Because as the Course says, illusions are as powerful in their effects as is the truth. So, in, and that is also why God, when like in traditional religion, they say God punishes you for your sins. He, that, the Course says that would be like punishing a little baby who's real upset and is knocking on your chest. The baby, does, the baby has no power to hurt you. Do you know what I mean? The baby thinks it's being this, nothing's really happening. And so the Course in Miracles says, God knows you as who you are. And so God would never be upset with you. God sees what you're doing as not hurting God, you're hurting yourself. And so God sees it not as a, something bad you're doing that you should be punished for. Your ego mind, which is leading you to do it, is punishing you. You're already in hell. God's not going to send you to hell for this. God is that which delivers you from the hell of your own making, which is a product of your own fear-based thinking because your mind is so powerful. Nothing you can do, the Course says, can diminish the power of your mind. So if you do use your mind for loving purposes, you will experience love. God himself will not violate his own law. The law of cause and effect is the building block of the universe. The Course says it was built for your protection. If you misuse the law by thinking with fear instead of love, God himself will not come in between the cause, the cause being your thought and the effect. Cause with a big C is love, meaning thought with God. Cause with a little C is your neurotic fear-based thoughts of attack, judgment, craziness in whatever form that fear takes. Well then, do you actually believe the mind of a woman can become into a body of a man? Yeah. I mean, I think How that's, is that mistake? That's kind of clear these How days. Is that? About, that, now you're talking about the phenomenal world. 
you're talking about the world of bodies, which is not what the Course in Miracles is. The course, that's why the Course doesn't use the term brothers and sisters. It just uses brothers. The Course in Miracles speaks of a plane on which there is no separation, even according, even by, uh, by sex. So in the Course, you would be my brother, right? Now, in terms of all that transgender stuff, and all, I mean, something amazing is happening on the planet. Clearly, I, I wonder, and maybe some people would have thoughts about this. Is this happening more than it did before and we just didn't know? Or is it happening more now? Being recognized. So you think it was happening? Because the things you see on the news now about little children and something amazing is happening there, isn't it? So clearly, I, if, if I ever doubted that, I don't doubt it anymore with all the stories I've read about and seen on news, clearly. So do you, do you feel that certain ideas that come to certain people come through God, like the internet? The Course in Miracles says love is what comes from God. Love is what God is, and we are ideas in the mind of God. So the Course in Miracles says love is, is pouring into each of us all the time. Every fraction of every moment, love is pouring into you. You are either opening yourself and allowing it to flow through you, or you are closing, based on thinking that you're not safe to think it, or it's not what you were taught to think, or it wasn't the training of the world. The, I love how in the Course it says, my way is not difficult, but it is different. Living a more loving life isn't more difficult, but it's just different. We were so trained to think differently. And it's just a retraining of our mental musculature. So the Course in Miracles says, miracles occur naturally as expressions of love. So when we think with love, miracles happen. When we do not think with love, we deflected the miracle that would have happened. But the universe, being so all-loving because it is the mind of God, is therefore all-merciful. So even when we think without love, the miracle we could have had is held in trust for us until we are ready to receive it. Isn't that beautiful? Which means the situation's going to come back around again. Maybe you'll love them next time. Cool? Okay. I'm, I'm, we, okay. I, I did learn from last week why it is and the wonderful people who work for the Saban, and I, I do understand that they need to go home. So uh, thank you very, very much. God willing, as my mother would say, we will be here next Monday night. Thank you, and thank all of you on live stream. Um, did you add, honey, everybody we were talking about? Did you? I don't see Tom. OK. Thank you very much. Let's pray. <clears throat> Dear God, we join our minds in prayer. We pray for Joannette, for Claire, for Portia and Rosalie. We pray for Darren and for his family, for Nick, for Alexandra, for Jesse and Judith, for Tom, for Michael, for Wendy, for Jerry, for Diane, Ray, Jay, Ryan, Ilana, we pray for Terry, we pray for Buvami, for Lily, for Cecilia, and for Chris. We pray that all of those people receive the miracles they need. We pray as well for anyone that we think of now for whom we wish a miracle, a healing, and that includes ourselves. We place in God's hands our burdens, our fears, our visions, our hopes, our dreams, and all decisions to be made. And now we pray, dear God, that we might be who you would have us be, that we might do as you would have us do. And now go forth in confidence and go forth in peace. For there are angels to your left and angels to your right. There are angels in front of you and angels behind you. There are angels above you and angels below. There is a path of light God has created and paved out of all darkness and into light. In any moment of fear, remember that you are not alone. Reach out your hand to your divine elder brother. This is no idle fantasy. He is here. And so it is that we send our love before us, praying that in all ways 
we might be of the purity of mind and the purity of heart to be of service to a greater life. And so it is, together, we all say, amen. God bless you, everybody. Thank you. See you Monday. <laughs>